evening. Good afternoon, <laughs> friends, family of our panelists, fellow alumni, supporters of the University of Chicago. My name is Karen Hyman. I'm a member of the Alumni Board of Governors and of its Alumni Awards Committee and um, completing six years of service in, in a few months. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to our Uncommon Core session, Public Life and the Life of the Mind. Uh, two pieces of wisdom that I learned at the University of Chicago, uh, one from the great poet um, W.H. Auden, which is, let all our thanks be thanks. And I'm really grateful um, for this opportunity to introduce our panelists. The other piece of wisdom, be brief and be gone. <laughs> so I, I will attempt to um, adhere to that. Uh, we are responsible on the alumni board for recognizing professional achievement, public service, uh, distinction, um, and teaching. Uh, all of the awards that if you were fortunate enough to hear this morning, uh, you experienced. And as I look back, I've done many of these introductions over the last um, several years. They all sound reminiscent of Plato's Symposium, which is something to the effect of how good it is to gather with friends and talk about serious matters. And that's what we're going to try and do today, to really um, here in the room, experience the life of the mind, experience that relentless pursuit of truth that um, we don't necessarily feel exists in our public life. Uh, one of my great teachers here uh, was the late um, Kolakowski, um, who was a really fine thinker, fierce critic of Marxism and uh, commented about the life of the mind and political life, and I quote, uh, the key issue, I hasten to add, is not partisan politics, but rather the subordinating of intellectual life generally to non-intellectual, i.e. political imperatives. The greatest danger, the philosopher wrote, is the invasion of an intellectual fashion which wants to abolish cognitive criteria of knowledge and truth itself. The humanities and social sciences have always succumbed to various fashions, and this seems inevitable. But this is probably the first time that we are dealing with a fashion, or rather fashions, according to which there are no generally valid intellectual criteria. Indeed, it is this failure, the colonization of intellectual life by politics, that stands behind and fuels the degradation of liberal education and politics. The issue is not so much, or not only, the presence of bad politics, as the absence of non-politics in the intellectual life of the university. So it's my pleasure to introduce our panel of professional achievement winners, um, and brief biographies I'll offer and then we'll speak about their backgrounds. Leon Cass graduated from the college in 1958 and earned his medical degree in 1962. He's also celebrating his 60th year reunion at the laboratory school this weekend. Mr. Cass is the Abby Clark Harding Professor Emeritus of Social Thought and is currently based out of the American Enterprise Institute. Michael Shackman, partner at Miller Shackman and Beam LLP, is widely known for the federal court Shackman decrees, which have enjoined patronage hiring and firing of public employees in Chicago and Illinois. Mr. Shackman graduated from the college in 1962 and earned his law degree in 1966. Wall Street Journal foreign affairs columnist and deputy editorial page editor, Brett Stevens, is a 1995 graduate of the college. Mr. Stevens was awarded the 2013 Pulitzer Prize for commentary for his incisive columns on American foreign policy and domestic politics, often enlivened by a contrarian twist. <laughs> Finally, our panelists are joined by faculty moderator, uh, Nathan Tarkov, professor of social thought and political science and in the college. We will have an opportunity, of course, for Q&A at the end of the panel discussion, so we ask that you hold on to your questions until the end of the session 
So it is without further ado that I'd like to hand the conversation over to Professor Clark. Well, thank you, Karen, for introducing our panel. Thank you and whoever else is responsible for inviting me to uh, moderate. Uh, it's always, uh, I'm always happy to be involved in alumni weekend because although I'm one of the few people in the room and the only person on the panel who is not an alum, uh, I am the proud son of an alum and the proud father of two alumni. Um, and I'm especially uh, honored to be uh, asked to moderate this panel that requires no moderation. That includes my old friend and former colleague, Leon Cast, my former student, Brett Stevens, and my longtime hero, Michael Shackman. Uh, I, I can't resist, for those of you who may not live in Illinois, noting that it was only a, a few weeks ago that Mr. Shackman told the courts, believe it or not, that the city of Chicago no longer needs federal monitoring uh, it to uh, avoid patronage. But in case you thought he was relaxing a few weeks before that, he sued uh, the state of Illinois <laughs> on the uh, Department of Transportation for a similar um, malfactions. Um, Leon, you're first. Thank you. Thoughts about public life and the life of the mind. Thank you, and thank you all for joining us uh, for this discussion. I want to speak about this topic as I've experienced it, first in my student days at the University of Chicago, and second in Washington uh, when I was for four years chairman of the President's Council on Bioethics. Can you hear me up there? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Um, just a couple of clarifications. We should stipulate at the beginning that the mind has and can enjoy very many different lives. It can be scientific or poetic, technical or ethical, it may seek truth or it may seek victory, it may cultivate expertise or pursue wisdom. The life of the mind means different things. And the life of the mind has a contested relation to politics and public life. Uh, are they friends or are they enemies? Is philosophy entitled to govern, as Plato's Republic might suggest, or as the citizens of Athens thought, um, is philosophy and their arch philosopher Socrates a corrupter of the youth? Does progress in the arts and sciences lead to moral and political improvement as the Enlightenment believed, or does it lead to moral decay, corruption of taste, and ultimate loss of freedom as Rousseau believed? Um, and finally on this general question, uh, do we mean by the life of the mind that we should have government by people of expertise, or do we have government by ordinary citizens, knowledgeable or not? These are um, thematic questions that lurk behind the subject of our discussion. The Chicago of my day, which is 1954 to 1962, had a clear view and spirit of these matters. We had the Enlightenment view here, but with very important qualifications. First of all, the emphasis here was clearly on liberal education, not technical or vocational education. And liberal education was understood as an end in itself, and also the education of citizen rulers in a, in a polity where the people are sovereign. Um, our education was deliberately broad and philosophic, wisdom-seeking in spirit. It was radical in the sense that all questions were on the table. We looked into the roots of things, and we had specific courses that invited us to examine and challenge the prevailing presuppositions of all of the sciences, including the natural sciences. The great books were given special place here in the belief that old authors remain relevant to enduring human questions. We were concerned with the unity of knowledge. We did not simply accept as true the radical divide between the sciences and the humanities, the so-called two cultures. There were classes, indeed, that tried to integrate these things explicitly. And a quick word about the politics of our day. There were real political parties on campus, left and right. Uh, at a time, by the way, this is just after the Army McCarthy hearings when I arrived here, at a time when very few American campuses had any politics at all. Eisenhower was president, everything was fine with the world. Chicago had strong political parties, but always civil discourse. Um, and the unifying spirit on campus was liberal and democratic, small l and small d. By liberal, I mean fierce defenders of, uh, and reverence for freedom of speech, articulate debate, active discussion of all questions, but I think in the spirit of John Stuart Mill, not expressing yourself so that you can find out where you're coming, other people can find out where you're coming from, 
but freedom of speech and inquiry in the service of seeking the truth. And second, the place had a democratic spirit. We were not here being trained to become uh, leaders of, of, uh, in political life. It was, it was a high populism here. The education of citizens, not technocratic experts, uh, and where the people were sovereign, uh, it, the citizens needed to be educated if they were to rule, rule wisely. Mortimer Adler, as I recall, had the following syllogism. Uh, uh, the, the philosophy, proper rule requires philosophy. Um, in America, the people are sovereign, therefore the people have to be philosophers. Hence, the kind of Hutchins College education that was offered to us. I leave it to you to, dis to decide whether that makes any sense. Um, in 2001 and through 2005, I was chairman of the President's Council on Bioethics. And not uh, exactly self-consciously, but in retrospect, it turned out to be a wonderful opportunity to test the Chicago spirit in the public square on the vexed ethical and political questions raised by advances in biomedical technology, uh, biomedical science and technology, genetics, reproductive technologies, neuroscience, prolongation of life issues. Although the council was to begin with tied to debates about whether there should be federal funding of embryonic stem cell research, and we were asked to explore other specific policy questions. Our first charge um, was remarkable. We were supposed to undertake fundamental inquiry into the human and moral significance of developments in biomedical and behavioral science and technology. The task was philosophical, anthropological, cultural, not narrowly regulatory or policy driven. Uh, so the question was not is deed X or Y moral or immoral or should technology P or Q be funded or banned? But what is humanly at stake when life lived experientially encounters the results of life studied scientifically? So for example, we took up the subject of cloning not to so consider so much as to whether the technique was safe, but what it would mean if children arise not from the coupling of two, but the replication of one, or if procreation moves increasingly in the direction of manufacture. Um, in Chicago fashion, we asked questions not only about the best means to agree upon ends, but we also asked about the, uh, about the worthiness of the ends themselves. Um, and with our approach, it was also very much a Chicago approach, searching open inquiry, a deliberate um, and real diversity of opinions. Uh, we had all points of view represented on this bioethics council, unlike any council before. I don't know about the present one. We were obliged by our own decision to make the case both for and against any proposed idea or action. And we wrote and spoke not as experts, neither scientific nor bioethical, but as wisdom and prudence seeking citizens who were hoping to educate the president, the Congress, and our fellow citizens about the grave import of these technologies and their human significance. Uh, question, did we succeed? Um, uh, and I think the answer is yes and no, um, and how to strike the balance, um, I leave it for you to think. In three and a half years, we produced six books and one white paper, um, including a big book on human cloning and human dignity, a book on bi beyond therapy, biotechnology and the pursuit of happiness, a book on taking care, on ethical caregiving in our aging society, and an anthology of reading on being human to supply considerations that are neglected in the academic bioethics field. We did, I think, uh, and I'm, I'm really proud of this work, we did try to produce a richer bioethics, formulated not according to the technological means or the narrow abstract considerations of professional bioethics, but according to the important human goods that we seek to promote or defend. When it comes to the few attempts that we made to influence policy, I would say uh, we struck out. Um, we had one, one trial uh, in a report on reproduction and responsibility. This very fractious group of people finally unanimously agreed on some recommendations on certain practices that would be beyond the pale and that we ought to set down as, as prohibitions, legislatively speaking. We did a lot of homework. We had lots of friends who were willing to introduce this legislation. But it came a cropper because of special interest groups, each of them interested in only one thing, 
the scientists wouldn't hear of any kind of, re uh, of reservation that would restrict any practice that any scientist might some uh, where, uh, want to undertake. And the right to life people were, although friendly to some of this, thought we were insufficiently friendly to the embryo, and they refused to back it. So the whole thing failed, even though this was, this was very, I won't detail the, uh, the recommendation, absolutely ABC, solid elementary stuff, everybody agreed. I think, um, to close, uh, I think we were right to try to uh, enrich the subject of bioethics and to get it out of the hands of the ethical experts who have been invited in to previous bioethics councils or scientific meetings in the hope that after a while getting a seat at the table they would pronounce their blessings on the inevitable and go away. Um, we really did deliberate the issues. We tried to make clear what was at stake. And uh, I commend our, our reports to you for your, for your reading. I think you will find them interesting. Whether one can do public ethics, public bioethics, in a thoughtful way, uh, in, a, in a town where the congressman only listen if you tell them what to do when something is imminent and pressing, and they're not interested in the deeper aspects of the question, and where the lobbyists and interest groups are very well healed, and there's nobody really in favor of taking the time to think about these things carefully. I'm not sure that one can do this uh, in, in this setting, certainly not today. Thank you. Mr. Shackman? I'm going to stand up here and subject you to my opinions from here. Uh, <laughs> and this is going to be more along the lines of some experiences in life. And, uh, I'm not sure I can connect the dots for all of them, but let me talk a little bit about public life and about law and about education. How many lawyers are there in the room? <laughs> well, not, not too many, so if you catch me making mistakes, call me out. Um, I was a product of the college. Actually, I'm a product of lying in hospital where I was born. So, uh, it's hard to, to trump that in terms of uh, tenure here. Uh, and I've lived in the neighborhood with my wife, Melissa, since uh, I came to college here after having spent a year of apostasy at the University of Wisconsin. <laughs> I've been here in Hyde Park since 1960. So I was a part of and a product of the old college. And I must say I loved the old college. It was really a wonderful place. And the characters were wonderful. Uh, uh, Gerhard Meyer had managed to discover the method of causing a cigarette ash the last of his cigarettes, because in those days teachers smoked in course, courses longer than any other human being. The ash would be longer and longer. And sooner or later, the class would be focused not on what he was saying. <laughs> when is it going to go? <laughs> uh, and, and what he was saying was interesting. What was being said by the others who talked about not merely interesting, but uh, life lesson-wise, they required you to read not what the, the goal was not to determine what is the right answer to put on an exam, although that came later and had some importance, but could you read the raw data? Could you read the raw material? Could you start to draw some conclusions from it? And that was terrific, a terrific type of education. Now, at the same time I was experiencing this, I experienced yet a totally different uh, piece of the University of Chicago environment, and one that's equally relevant and important. I was a reporter on the Chicago Maroon, and eventually I became the national news editor of the Maroon, which since I was the national news staff of the Maroon, it didn't necessarily a whole lot. I met a few things of interest, such as going to Washington and interviewing Alfred Dirksen, who was then the senator, and he you know, must have thought I was a legitimate journalist, because he brought me into his office, sat me down, gave me half an hour, uh, and I sat there with him, and he had on the wall identical um, pen and ink sketches of himself and Abraham Lincoln. So I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't need a lot of uh, psychoanalytic <laughs> to conclusions from what you were seeing. But he was very gracious, very nice. And uh, that kind of experience was afforded me. But equally important, equally important, through the maroon, uh, I got a look at the real world of the inter of the connection, if you will, between the university and its commitment to the life of the mind and the city and its politics and its uh, corruption and its, its uh, completely different framework. And I got it through Julian Levy. I'm sure some of you here remember Julian Levy. He was Edward's older brother, uh, a lawyer like Edward, and 
when the university was uh, horribly concerned about the loss of white population, crime in the neighborhood, and lots of other things, Julian was hired to run the Southeast Chicago Commission, which was then the university's funded neighborhood group, and to attempt to put urban renewal into Hyde Park, and uh, to uh, persuade, uh, as someone said uh, uh, sarcastically at the time, to persuade everybody that Hyde Park was black and white united against the poor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Julian was, uh, was uh, not an academic in the sense that he recognized, and here's a lesson, he recognized that in order to be effective with the city, he needed more than uh, going down and talking to Richard J. Daly, who was then mayor, about how the university had problems and needed help. He needed leverage. So what Julian did, and this really impressed me as a young college student, and he was very accessible, he described these things. He said, well, we got lobbyists in Washington. And we got the Housing Act of 1959 or 60 or 61 amended so that every dollar spent by a university would count as if it had been spent by the local government for purposes of generating federal aid to cities if and only if the university certified those expenditures to Department of Housing and Urban Development. Put differently, <coughs> he had uh, obtained through that maneuver the ability to say to the city, we can certify, because the university was spending a ton of money on those days and rehabbing the neighborhood, rebuilding all sorts of things as it's done recently. He was able to say to the mayor, we love you, Mr. Mayor. You're the greatest mayor that's ever been seen. And if you, by the way, like us to certify $200 million of expenditures, we need things in terms of Hyde Park Urban Renewal Plan. We want this done. We want parks here. We want streets here. We want streets redirected so it's hard to drive through the neighborhood and on and on and on and on for people coming from outside. So was it good? Was it bad? Was it moral? Was this an appropriate way for a big university to deal with a big government that was basically uh, corrupt? Um, you decide. But you wouldn't have the university that we have here today. You wouldn't have the neighborhood that we have here today if you didn't have uh, Julian Levy and the Southeast Chicago Commission and the, the clever uh, strategizing that they they parlayed into real influence over city government because it's not likely that the city would have, uh, would have done as much as it did for the university. So that was an eye-opening uh, experience. And then I worked in volunteer politics in the 1960s at the same time I was in college and uh, graduate school because I did go to, uh, to uh, I pursued a degree in political science and got a master's degree after which they said, we don't think, Shackman, you're going to make it in political science. Why don't you look elsewhere? Mm -hmm. And uh, by then, I'd already decided to go to law school, so I gave up uh, any aspirations of being a political science professor. But a part of the, uh, the interesting part of public life in Chicago was to see the patronage system at work in these local elections, where we were trying to elect state representatives and ultimately Abner Mick for the Congress, and to see how the system really worked up close. Because whatever you might have read in the great books about government, the polity, democracy, and the like. You also got quite a, lection, uh, a lesson from a precinct captain uh, over on the on a precinct uh, near the lake who uh, implemented Plato's democracy by short penciling the ballot. Now, short penciling the ballot is a, what you do is, uh, in those days, was paper ballots. And the precinct worker was normally not supposed to be touching the ballots. But since the precinct captain had a government job, appointed the election judges who had government jobs. They were pretty informal. And our, our goal as precinct watchers was to make sure that when it time, came time to count the ballots, some ballots hadn't been properly executed, that the precinct captain what, what didn't have about an inch of pencil sharpened between his fingers like this, so that as he's going through the ballots, he's also marking the ballots. <laughs> that was part of the, the lesson in how government actually worked in Chicago. So that in turn led to when, when I ran for a delegate to the Constitutional Convention uh, when I was just out of law school, 1969, a one-time uh, governmental office, uh, to my becoming a candidate, and my friend from law school, Dick Johnson, coming up with this bright idea that we could we could hold the patronage system unconstitutional. Uh, Dick uh, really get, deserves the credit for coming up with that, and I, I implemented it by being the uh, guinea pig. And, didn't know that I was going to be a 50-year guinea pig, but uh, <laughs> it's turned out to be the case. Um, and I, I won't dwell on that case be, right now, because if you have questions later, we can answer them. But 
uh, frankly, after uh, 44 years of litigation, the topic has gotten a little old for me. <laughs> <laughs> Last, I want to turn to the practice of law, because the life of the topic is the public life and the life of the mind. And one of the wonderful uh, ironies of my uh, career is that while I wanted to be a professor of political science because I thought I could deal in an interesting way with public issues <coughs> as, a, uh, as a professor uh, teaching somewhere on that topic, turns out that I've been able to deal with a host of fascinating issues as a lawyer, not just the patronage issues and public employment, but uh, for example, I just was sitting here noting some of the neat cases I've been able to, to deal with. Um, Closing Biggs Field, the airport in the lake. Uh, should the city have the ability to terminate that facility? And uh, did the state have the control over the land and the ability to trump the city and prevent it from closing? Uh, zoning issues of all sorts. Uh, are people allowed to misuse their property and let it run down? Do neighbors have the right to bring suits and stop them? Would, would uh, people in Athens in the 5th century BC have been able to enjoin a unattractive nuisance next to them? Perhaps not. Um, current issues, uh, Uber versus taxis. I currently represent a bunch of taxi industry people. Uh, should the investment they've made, a massive investment in buying medallions so that they can operate taxis at $300,000 plus a piece be vitiated because uh, uh, the city authorizes smartphone apps to uh, to dispatch taxis and to dispatch uh, other people who provide taxi-like services? Uh, nurses' wages, uh, interesting lawsuit, antitrust lawsuit, over whether uh, the hospitals in Chicago were uh, conspiring to set nurses' wages uh, and ex ex exercise monopsony power over purchasing wages, uh, purchasing services, so as to limit uh, what nurses uh, earned. Legal malpractice cases, that's a large part of my practice, defending lawyers and law firms in legal malpractice. Takes you into practically everything that lawyers do and uh, everything that people can think of to sue them for doing. So all of those are, are wonderfully interesting topics. Uh, they're just a short list that I put together as I was thinking about it in connection with this talk. And all of them are public life issues, because all of them are issues that involve the public and public interest. Although you come to it from the point of view of representing a client who trying to implement the client's goals within the system. And in the process uh, of dealing with issues like that, you get to use your mind and use your intellect and be a close reader of texts, which if the University of Chicago education taught anything, it taught be a close reader of texts. You cannot go to point B until you've mastered point A, and point A is just that. Um, I think that's, uh, that covers uh, what I want to talk about at this point. And if people have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, Nathan. Very nice to see you again. Um, uh, so, one of the things that winning this award, which I learned of about six months ago, has made me do is think a great deal about my time at the University of Chicago and um, how I came to the university, what I learned in it, and how it uh, has stayed with me uh, in many ways, and sometimes in ways that take take me by surprise um, uh, ever since. And the first conclusion I've reached is I think I was one of those people who was really born to come to this university. Uh, when I grew up, I grew up uh, in Mexico City um, with a father who uh, cared a great deal about politics, but he cared about politics because he cared about the ideas behind politics. Um, uh, and it had been a part of his life uh, since, since his uh, earliest days. After his parents were divorced, his mother remarried uh, a now well-known composer, uh, Colin Ancaro, who had been uh, in his youth a member of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. So I think by the age of seven, I knew what the Abraham Lincoln Brigade uh, was, and uh, I knew how, on account of his participation in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, he had ended up coming to um, spend the rest of his life uh, outside of the United States in, in, uh, uh, in Mexico. Um, so these issues, particularly those connected with the Cold War, were very much a part of our household conversation from um, almost as long as I can, uh, I can remember. I remember trying to make my way, actually fairly successfully, through a day in the life of Ivan Denisovich when I was about nine or 10 years old. And so kids who, know what the Lincoln Brigade was at the age of six and know about Solzhenitsyn by 10 and the Gulag Archipelago 
and who in high school cared, cared passionately about the intermediate New, uh, intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Agreement, the 1987 treaty, which I argued against uh, back then at the age of 14. And now it turns out the Russians are cheating on it, so I was right. Um, uh, kids like me sort of found a way to, uh, to the University of Chicago. There was a profile in the New York Times, I'm happy to say, of uh, Hannah Holborn Gray uh, when I was uh, a junior or senior in high school. My mother spotted it, clipped it out, and said, you're applying to this school. Uh, and I'll never forget uh, coming to campus, sitting in on a few of uh, the seminars, and uh, realizing that I had been born to go to this place. Uh, and uh, almost any other school, I would have been um, a fish out of water, to say the least. Uh, but here, I, I would belong. And it turned out to be very true. Uh, when I was a freshman, I had the great gift of taking, I guess it's Soch 101, uh, which starts with uh, the, uh, uh, the dialogues uh, concerning the trial and death of Socrates. It takes you all the way through the genealogy of morals, maybe a little beyond that. Um, and that was one of the great courses of my life. And it was particularly great when I had, for the middle term, the winter term, a great teacher named uh, Ralph Lerner, who insisted this was a great lesson for me, that no paper be longer than two pages long. Um, because it's very easy to write long, but it's really hard to write short. Uh, and that was, a, that was a great lesson. And in addition to that, I learned a great deal from, uh, from Ralph Lerner. I, I, I consumed those books. I remember writing my final blue book uh, essay. Uh, and I had read over Locke and Hobbes and was so, caref so carefully that I was actually able to cite passages just from memory, because these books were sort of telling me things that I always wondered about. And so I would, I would read them, and I would read them again and again and again. And where else but the University of Chicago could you have that experience? One of the things I learned in Social 101 is that all great political philosophy starts as a kind of anthropology. So um, the spring semester of my freshman year, I thought, well, if it's all really about anthropology, I should take an anthro course. I lasted one day. Uh, <laughs> But it gave me the idea that if I wasn't going to do um, anthropology as a, as a discipline, that I could take a course about human origins. And there was this course on offer uh, uh, that was about uh, the book of Genesis. Um, and so a, uh, one of the great days of my life was walking into a seminar uh, on, uh, on Genesis. And as Alan Bloom says in a different context, um, but if I can just adapt a line of his from the closing of the American mind, one day I walked into a seminar uh, on, on Genesis and, and felt as if I'd found my life. Um, so it was one of those great, great uh, moments um, for me intellectually. I still maintained an interest in anthropology, and sometime in my sophomore year, I picked up a book by a UCLA anthropologist, a very fine anthropologist named Robert Edgerton, called Six Societies. And it was essentially a... Um, uh, uh, it was a polemic, but it was an academic polemic against the kind of anthropology that had been performed by people like uh, Malinowski and uh, Margaret Mead, which had famously in the early 20th century painted prim primitive societies in Polynesia as these kind of Dionysian, uh, happy-go-lucky, wonderful places. And uh, instead he painted portraits of six societies, societies where uh, misogyny, brutality, um, uh, what he called maladaptive cultural practices were uh, endemic, were ubiquitous. So I found this really very interesting. And as a thought experiment, I thought, why don't I just try my hand at writing a book review? So over Christmas break, my sophomore year, just as I was done with this um, Genesis uh, seminar, um, most of you probably have guessed this guy. Um, uh, I, um, I thought, you know what? I'm going to try to write a review of this book. And so I, I sat down and I wrote what I thought would be like a review. You know, and reviews aren't something college kids do, but it would be interesting. And I showed it to my father. I said, you know, this is not bad. Why don't you send it to a magazine? So I said, OK. So I sent it to this magazine that I'd been reading, Commentary Magazine. And um, I got a note saying, we'd like to publish your piece, and we'll pay you $350. <laughs> this was another of those great moments. <laughs> were they going to publish me, but they were going to pay me the princely sum of $350, which, you know, 
it would take you to the Met for a solid week, if not more, <laughs> take, take, take your friends out uh, uh, too. So this was another just, you know, one of these uh, touchstone moments in my life. The idea that you could, you could actually make a living, not just in the life of the mind, but a life of the mind that was also uh, combined uh, thoughtfulness with influence, thoughtfulness even with action. So it was not very uh, surprising that a few years after I left the University of Chicago, I ended up on the um, editorial pages of, uh, uh, of the Wall Street Journal, which had uh, not only a point of view uh, in, in the political sense uh, congenial to my own, but a way of going about its point of view that was intellectually congenial to, to mine. I think it was um, honest and not simply uh, rankly, uh, rankly partisan. One of the great joys I have being a, a columnist is I get to go to places. I was just spent a couple weeks in Afghanistan about a month ago. I, last weekend I was in, in Belgrade for a conference on the origins of the First World War. And so you get to go around and meet very interesting people in odd, strange situations. Um, any of you want to take a vacation in Afghanistan? <laughs> strongly do not recommend it. Um, uh, but at the same time, it allows you to think about um, think about great issues of the day. And think about them, I think, in a way that goes beyond what is common in a lot of um, political commentary. Uh, I've been looking over columns I've written over the last few years, not, not simply because of um, ego and vanity, but just kind of getting a sense of the University of Chicago input. Um, and it turns out to be fairly considerable. I, I just wrote a, a column about Sergeant Bergdahl, which managed to slip in a reference to Maimonides. Um, and if, if those, some of you who have read my, uh, my column on the class of, my letter to the class of 2014, if you spot the Emily Bronte reference, uh, I'll, I'll, buy you a, I'll buy you a milkshake at the, uh, at the Medici. But what I, think, um, uh, what I think I've tried to do in my column is bring a, something of a philosophical frame of mind to uh, the great political and especially uh, international uh, issues of the day. I mean, take a subject like the burqa. Uh, in France and Belgium and Germany, um, there has been this tremendous debate about the advisability of allowing uh, women uh, to walk around in either what is called a niqab uh, uh, or a burqa, the full facial covering. And then there are questions then about what is more known more traditionally about a, a hijab, which is just the covering of, of hair, much more common in many religions, many societies. Um, now, how should we think about this? I mean, for I think anyone who's sort of a normal liberal, and I mean that in the kind of traditional Democrats and Republicans together sense, this is really kind of a problematic issue because on the one hand we want to respect the concepts of personal autonomy and that's the way you want to dress in free society. We should not tell you how you should dress. On the other hand, liberal democracies also expect people in the public square to, to be able to recognize one another in that public square. And what does it mean if there are people in the public square who are looking at it as it were through a one-way mirror? And is that a kind of society, is that a kind of dispensation we really want to allow in the name of something we are calling freedom but looks very much like the opposite of freedom? And this requires a certain kind of philosophical thinking. I'm not saying, and I, I personally happen to believe that the French are absolutely right in banning the niqab uh, and the burqa just for the same reason that they're absolutely right to prohibit people from wearing face masks at, at, at public um, at, at, at public protests, but it needs, this is the kind of topic that needs a richer, uh, not only political, but philosophical articulation than it, than it tends to get. Another example, uh, and another way in which I, I credit to my University of Chicago back then, is take a look at, for instance, the, the uh, abortive revolution in Iran in, uh, in 2009. Well, it was a really fascinating uh, event for, for many reasons. Um, and I think if you had gone to the University of Chicago, you were a certain cast of mind, you'd say this revolution in 2009 is very much like the revolution in Hungary in 1956, in which uh, political figures who appear at the beginning to be a part of the regime end up through the process of a revolution 
becoming uh, enemies of, uh, uh, of, of the regime. That's just what happened in, in Hungary in 56, and, and, and I guess you could say also in Dubček in, in Czechoslovakia in 1968. And it was just what was happening in 2009. And that was relevant because um, when the United States government was saying, well, it doesn't matter that uh, Mousavi uh, uh, was, was set aside because after all, he's a creature of the regime. Well, he was a creature of the regime the day before the election, but I'm not sure he was one uh, five days uh, after. That requires some kind of philosophical reflection about the nature of, of revolutions. The final example that's been very much on my mind is what has happened uh, in Egypt in the last uh, three, three and a half years since the events of Tahrir, uh, Tahrir Square. Because we Americans tend to think of these words liberal and democratic, which, which we all referred to earlier as, as kind of indivisible and inseparable. But think about it for a moment. They're not indivisible and inseparable. You, we know examples of uh, non-democratic regimes, which are relatively liberal. Uh, Turkey, up until 10 years ago, was a very good example of an autocratic liberal state. We also know many examples of um, illiberal democracy. And Gaza, after the 2006 election of, of uh, Hamas, or for that matter, Turkey, under the rule of, um, of Mr. Erdogan, has been a fairly good example of, illiberal, uh, of, of an illiberal democracy. So how do we go about thinking about this nature between liberalism and democracy? And what is it that we as Americans really should want? I mean, we have a fairly good idea that liberal cultures will eventually produce democratic political systems. In 2003, the Bush administration gambled that democratic political systems will in time produce liberal cultures. That if you essentially give a country like Iraq something like a democratic constitutional system, eventually you will generate liberal values. Not necessarily the case. And those were precisely the sorts of issues that were and are playing out first through the government of uh, Mohammed, uh, uh, Mr. Morsi, the Mohammed Morsi, the Muslim brother, elected president, and now El Presidente, um, uh, General Sisi, um, uh, the, new, uh, the new popularly elected, popular dictator, I might say, of, um, of Egypt. So these are the sorts of issues that come up when I think you have the benefit um, of a University of Chicago education. I would say one final point. I, I, I gave a little talk yesterday at the Institute of Politics, and I was with, uh, I'd never met her before, Anna Marie Cox, who is um, a, uh, the founder of the Wonkett blog, and has been a columnist for The Guardian, and I think the uh, left, left of center page. was a lovely woman. Uh, I, I enjoyed her talk, but at one point in her talk, she said something like, you know, one of the things I realized in Chicago is that politics touches everything. We have to understand how politics touches the roads, the schools, you know, the air, the air you breathe, and so on. Um, uh, Twelve years ago, I, um, I took a, a young woman, uh, at the time a young woman, a still a young woman, uh, on a drive. Uh, I was living in Israel at the time, and she, um, we were, we were, we had a little, decided to put out something on, uh, to listen to, and we listened to Mahler 4, which I'd never heard before. And it simply, the experience of Mahler 4 was one of those moments in my life. And as we're listening to this incredible piece of music, um, this woman I was with, Corinna, started talking about what the music meant to her. Um, and it conjured images in her mind, and she was describing those. And it was a great moment, because I thought, you know, all my life from the beginning, I was cared about Solzhenitsyn and the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and Iran and so forth. And here was this woman, and all she could think about was the beauty of Mahler IV. And it was beautiful, completely irrespective of race, gender, equality issues, uh, uh, patriarchy, you, you name it. It was just beautiful, and it moved her. And it was an experience that was complete in itself. Uh, and so I ended up marrying that woman, and uh, <laughs> she's uh, wandering around with our kids somewhere. Um, so I guess the last thing I would just want to say is that politics is, is fascinating and interesting and very, very important. I think it's so important to remember that at the end of the day, politics has its limits. Um, there is life and interest well beyond uh, whatever uh, a United States senator has to say on any given subject, or pundits like me, or professors. Um, uh, and it's important to remember that it keeps you, uh, it makes you a decent human being. So they're thoughtful and actually, as I think about it, quite different pictures of the relation of the life of the mind to public life. And open the floor to questions. 
uh, I'll make uh, only a few requests of you. Uh, you don't even, it doesn't even have to be a question. It can be a comment, but it must be brief, and I'd like to ask you, if possible, to stand up and briefly identify uh, yourself. The floor is open. Oh, yes. Hi, uh, Professor Tarbach. I'm Bill Sullivan, I'm a student from 1984. Mm -hmm. You taught with David Grusin that year? Thank you. Um, for, uh, I'm sorry, my, my glass is not Brett. Yes. Let's start with the Mahler 4. Um, I have about 10 or 15 recordings of it. I grew up listening to it. And you were alluding to the universal aspects of this beauty. You started your comments by talking about the ideas behind politics. And throughout your comments, you discussed concepts like liberalism with respect to different cultures around the world. I was wondering if in all of your um, encounters with cultures around the world, are you able to universalize certain political concepts like liberalism in the same way that the Mahler Four can be universalized? Liberalism, conservatism, and, and how might you define them universally speaking? Wonderfully universal. <laughs> Very difficult question to answer. Um, I'd like to believe that there's a universality to liberalism, um, uh, and at the same time, be mindful uh, that there are pragmatic limits to the applicability of that universality, and that there is also um, room for interpretation as to what liberalism uh, is. Uh, and that's in part because uh, liberalism in the United States uh, differs radically from what, uh, say, the liberalism of Robert Maynard Hutchinson's day uh, uh, would have been. Uh, so we have to kind of be more specific about what kind of liberalism we are uh, uh, speaking about. Um, if, you, if the question is, should we think that liberalism is universal in the sense of taking it um, as, um, uh, as a statement of, let, let me think about how exactly I want to put this. Um, we should have, as we have a presumption of innocence in courts, we should have a, have a presumption that all people in all cultures are capable of living liberal lives in the sense that we know the word liberalism from uh, John Stuart Mill and Karl Popper and people like that, yes, I think that should be seen as, as universal. I think we have to be very careful, though, um, about how we go about uh, applying it. And we have to be mindful that the experience of liberalism in the United States and in the West is radically different from what you're likely to find in places like Egypt and, and Iraq. Uh, I, people ask me, how do you define your politics? And I now talk about myself as a, um, as a paleo-neocon. That is to say, I'm more sympathetic to the neoconservatism of Jean Kirkpatrick circa 1979 uh, um, than I am to the neoconservatism of, of um, uh, I don't know, Richard Pearl or even my friend Paul Wolfowitz, 2003 or, or four, respectful of both Richard and, and, and Paul, because the, the experience of the last 10 years um, should be a fairly sobering one about how you about how easy it is, or rather how difficult it is, to go into places like Iraq, like Afghanistan, uh, like Egypt, and expect to obtain um, uh, outcomes that correspond even remotely with the kind of liberalism that you or I uh, would like to see. There are kinship societies, there are tribal societies, there are brutalized societies, and it's simply not not enough to go in and say, we're going to give you a democratic constitution. One third of your parliament is going to consist of women. Uh, and uh, and uh, we, we look forward to your joining the community of liberal democracies. That just hasn't been, hasn't been the experience. Is Russia having similar problems, too? Gosh, no, Russia is an interesting question. Um, you know, I've been tempted, and I'm going to say this almost, almost because it's a terrible thing to say. Uh, I've, I've been tempted to write a column, which I haven't yet done, called Confessions of a Lucifer. Um, 
namely because when I think about it, every member of my family fled Russia. Uh, and that's probably true of some large percentage of people who are here. Uh, either you fled you know, the Czechists or the white Russians or the, you know, the Bolsheviks or the Cossacks or something or other. So what is it about Russian culture that uh, um, has such antibodies to um, liberal political thinking? I don't know. Um, I don't know what the answer to that is. I do think that Vladimir Putin is very opportunistically milking a strain of Russian conservatism to shore up his political legitimacy, and so far doing it with um, so much success that it should temper our faith in Russia's, or, or, or curb our enthusiasm for Russia's liberal future. I'm friendly with Gary Kasparov, which is a big claim to make. Um, uh, I, but uh, Gary's been telling me, uh, for years, I think 10 years, oh, you know, Putin, he's going to be gone in months. He's going to be gone in months. Um, and I mean, Gary is, I think, certifiably the smartest guy in the world, right? But he's got an 11-year record of, of total error. Uh, uh, so um, Russia's a good example of, of it, should, it should, in the Larry David sense, curb our enthusiasm for the universality of liberalism, at least in the next few years. We have time for a couple more questions in the back row there. Yes. Um, if, a may, if a professor at a major university writes a book, gives lectures, makes comments that are offensive and insulting uh, and irritating to a major group and thereby threatens donations, perhaps tens of millions of dollars in donations, uh, to the university, how should the university handle that situation, assuming the professor is, does rigorous and serious work. Who would like to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll take a shot at it. It depends on what your view of the role of the university is. Uh, and uh, I'd like to think the right answer is uh, if the work is intellectually responsible, uh, but people can differ with it, intellectually responsible and highly controversial, that's exactly what universities are supposed to be places uh, to support or at least tolerate. So it would be very, it would be very inconsistent with the role of the university as a place of uh, open dis discourse and debate to, to you know, sanction that professor because of financial constraints. Um, if not at the university, where else is that kind of freedom going to be tolerated? No, I, I agree with that completely. Um, I also think that um, uh, in our present time, uh, the problem is not so much uh, that donors get upset with certain uh, outlandish opinions by some professors, but that internal to many universities, uh, uh, certain kinds of orthodoxies are now so dominant that um, people who don't agree with those orthodoxies can't be heard on those campuses. And the news have been filled with various disinvitations recently by student protests. But Chicago was always wonderful in this respect, and I think remains wonderful in this respect. If you have uh, a serious position seriously held, everybody is better for hearing you out. Because the question is, is it true, not does it please you? Thank you. I have a question for the Professor Kass. It has to do with orthodoxy. At 6 o'clock every Tuesday morning in Southern California, I get a splitting headache, and I realize it's I just finished reading Brett Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, uh, when he was your student 20 years ago, did you recognize any modesty or moderation at all? <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, I should say that um, I look forward to Tuesday morning. Um, uh, I like his boldness. I don't always agree with every word, but I like his boldness. I like his independence. I like that there's a mind at work on there. I like his fearlessness. I like his prose. Um, and uh, that's a real contribution to our public life. And um, 
very proud to have had a small hand in his education. I know, take no credit for his gifts. He wrote a paper in that Genesis class for me on the War of the Kings in Genesis 14, which opened up the chapter for me. I never understood what it was about. And this is, he's a sophomore in college. Um, and um, I would say, look, one wants, one wants people to have opinions, to be firm about them, to put them out there, to listen to other arguments if they're available. Um, and I don't think it's um, either immodest or lacking in humility to, uh, when you think that there are issues that are burning of the day and you care passionately about them, and you have a pen that can provoke thought about important things, do it. I think Brett Stevens is a national treasure. And that independent, and that independent, independent of the content, I think there are people on the left who are national treasures because they make the argument forcefully and clearly, so you have to think about it. It's true. I, I can't tolerate his opinions, but I've been reading them for <laughs> Go on reading them, but take Advil. <laughs> I believe at this point I'm supposed to hand the floor over to Darren Riceberg. Well, we can. Yeah. We're yeah. going over. Okay, I'm now authorized by the authorities over here. We can have a couple more questions. Hi, I'm Craig Cahill, AB88. I'm a mid-career physician, and so this is um, self-motivated, but directed at Dr. Cass. Hearing about these uh, critical moments, the Mahler Four, your political science uh, thesis supervisor telling you perhaps to find another way. I'm interested in those times in your life where you found a way to be in the public, um, to stimulate public discourse as a physician. Um, you know, it's, it, it's not typical. We, we see patients in offices. And uh, can you identify any of those, those points that you had that, that sort of moved you in that direction? Look, I didn't last long in medicine. I did an internship. Um, I then went into biochemistry and was a graduate student. And then I did research at NIH until um, uh, 1970. And then, um, well, it's, the answer would be, the, the, this particular anecdote would be much, much too long. But it, it suddenly dawned on me, I was always interested in ethical questions, always as a boy, it's, it's the gift of my mother. Um, and, uh, and we were involved in civil rights work, my wife Amy and I in Mississippi, and uh, came back and, dis and discovered that you know, there were moral questions rolling around right at my feet as a researcher in NIH, um, which were far more challenging um, intellectually than the questions of segregation, the question of segregation, intellectually simple. It was an evil. And the only question was, what do you do about it, and how can you get rid of it? Um, uh, the question about um, uh, intervening in the human body and mind, on the one hand, to relieve suffering, on the other hand, to begin to change in a wholesale way the relation between, between pleasure and human activity, uh, or the way babies are produced in the world, all these sorts of things. Uh, these are brought to you not by the evildoers, but by the well-wishers of humankind. And they come with costs which are often not recognized. And for me, uh, reading something like The Brave New World, it handed to me at a time when I was right to read it, or reading Rousseau's Discourse on the Arts and Sciences when I was fresh from this experience, um, opened up for me the fact that, look, you don't have to go to Mississippi or someplace like that to be morally engaged in questions. There were intellectual challenges, by the way, for which there were things in my university education that really helped prepare me. This teacher I mentioned at the assembly before, Joe Schwab, gave me an insight that there was such a thing as a philosophy of biology and not just the technical, you know, there were really philosophical questions. 
What accounts for the unity and wholeness of an organism? What actually do you mean by alive? Question that no practicing biologist ever spends five minutes on. What is health? That medical textbooks, the word health doesn't occur in the index. <laughs> and, yet, and yet we're supposed to be healers. So um, this was not so much in public life, but I joined the Hastings Center at its beginning, Institute of Ethics and Life Sciences. I did some writing. Um, actually, I worked for the National Research Council as a staff person. I took one year leave of absence from the lab, and it turned into 44. <laughs> um, but um, I always thought of my work really as, as, as not really political or pu public. I would write not for academic journals, but for magazines for, of, 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 sort of public. I, I didn't write technical articles. I tried to speak to the educated citizen in, in, in language terms, uh, speaking up to them rather than down to them in a way. Um, but I never thought I'd get mixed up in, in explicitly public life until um, uh, well, there were a group of people said, look, we've had all this bioethics for 30 years. What difference has it made to anything? Why don't we try to find some issue in which we can set down some kind of marker and say it's not going to be business as usual. We'll place the burden of proof on the other side that says transgressing this boundary is good to do. Um, and we settled on human cloning, for which there were claims uh, uh, the, the uh, dolly, the sheep, had been, been cloned. There were talk about these people were, were engaged in human cloning. Turned out they were, they were fakers. But they said, OK, the public is revolted by the idea of human cloning. Now is the time. Let's enact a piece of legislation banning human cloning in the United States. Almost every other country in the world had done it by this time, all, at least all of the uh, the, the, the so-called Western countries, Japan, other places, right? Um, and we decided to do this as a test case. And I, I'd been writing on this subject. It was my first essay in bioethics in the newspapers in 1967. Um, so I figured, it's, look, it's time to put up or shut up. I better do something. And I would go and give testimony in Congress um, on human cloning. And, um, the Bush administration wasn't interested in cloning. They were interested in stem cell research because they were getting beaten up in the newspaper every day after the election on this subject. And so when they finally produced their stem cell decision and the compromise to allow the funding to take place, because Congress had outlawed it, um, they set up this council and they asked me would I be the chairman of it. And um, well, I, I just felt like I couldn't say no. I mean, I'd spent my life thinking about these questions. I wasn't sure that there was anything you could do in big public. And by the way, I'm not sure there is something you can do at the national level. There's a lot you can do where you live. There's a lot you can do uh, for promoting the better doctor-patient relation in an age of paperwork and uh, intrusiveness of various uh, oversights. Um, there are lots of things that one can do to um, see that people with terminal illness um, have proper hospice care. Um, and to do this not just singly by yourself, but to try to produce groups within the, with the medical community and the people in the local area begin to get together and talk about these things. Um, I think we have a tendency to think that any problem worth solving is solvable at the national level. I'm very doubtful about that. And I really do think that there are marvelous opportunities in just about every, there's some things that can only be national questions. I mean, defense is a national question. Uh, um, various things like that. But in all of the areas that I'm interested in, I'm not sure. I mean, I thought, I was just saying, I thought it would be very salutary that there should be one occasion in which um, the people of the United States, after suitable debate, would say there are certain kinds of boundaries that you have to prove to us it's good to cross. And those were our recommendations from our council. You know, um, you don't ever put an embryo into a human a woman's womb except to try to create a baby. She's not to be used in an experimental laboratory. You should never cross a human sperm with an animal, egg, or vice versa. Um, it's elementary things. And I thought it would be, look, we've never done this. We've always believed in the self-justification of progress. And yet, 
brave new worldly considerations are growing yearly. Wouldn't it be nice if we had one example where the people said, you show us, prove to us that we should cross this boundary. For the time being, we'll place a moratorium on it. And that was worth a try, but I'm not sure you can do it. So it seems to me that, and, and by the way, the more important ethical issues, the more important ethical issues of every day are not these grand things that we bioethicists talk about, the conundrums. They really are the things built into the everyday life that you practice and where um, well, you don't have to be told medical practice might be more accessible, it might be more effective, but very few people have doctors um, who practice medicine the way your parents did, that your parents' doctors did. And, and a humanistic medicine is um, a, a thing most needful and increasingly precarious. Hi, my name is uh, Ray Lopez Calderon, uh, AB 99, uh, in philosophy of science, I mean, uh, <laughs> But uh, my question is more about uh, democracy here in America. I know we talked a little bit about uh, other countries and sort of whether or not they can ever become liberal type or, uh, countries. But um, I work for an organization called Common Cause, which is sort of a leftover of the 70s when we had a time when we had liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats working on um, very similar issues. And, uh, trying to work on tapering the democracy. And I think uh, one of the things I find in this organization these days is that it's very difficult to have a conversation like a University of Chicago conversation where you're asking questions about whether it's left or right, whether this is the right thing or not the right thing, because the people that we need to achieve changes within Congress, for example, are afraid to death to say anything that might possibly be viewed as uh, being reflective. Um, it's, it's one of the uh, sort of Things I think I, th I think, and you know, I'm not old enough, but it seems like a lot has changed over the years. Um, that that kind of conversation I think needs to happen in Congress. But you also mentioned Professor Cass about special interest in lobbying, uh, lobbies sort of killing some of the things you you want, wanted to do. Do you, in your years of experience, feel that there is some hope, even with all of this sort of rampant polarization and difficulty in the public square, to have an honest, truthful, and logical conversation with people? Do you feel that there's hope for us? What What is it we think we should be doing? People like me. You may want something on this, too. I'm always prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, <clears throat> the climate is very poisonous, and it's overdetermined why. Um, the extremes. Um, Produce better sound bites. Maybe not, maybe not better, but more shocking, and therefore they get, they get the play. Um, when I would give testimony, and I was talking to Senator uh, Sanders about this this morning, when I would give testimony in Congress, um, some some bright staff member had researched my writings and found some idiotic thing I said. <laughs> and, the first, and he puts this in front of the senator, and the senator says, uh, Dr. Cass, did you once say the following thing? Or did you once suppose this? And so on. And the point wasn't really to have a discussion of the issue, but to fairly categorize as unreliable or as kooky. Um, something's there. And it happens to lots of people on all sides. It depends on who's running the hearing and who's digging up what everybody has said something stupid that they did. <laughs> okay. um, uh, you know, I don't know whether we should, whether we should be, uh, sometimes one is depressed at how, um, how little uh, real thoughtful there is, thoughtfulness there is about deep and important public questions. Uh, I don't think our political campaigns, the political campaigns basically believe the American voters are dumb. And um, they treat them that way, and very often the voters um, oblige. Uh, we don't have, uh, I mean, it's amazing to think that there were Lincoln-Douglas debates or read the speeches of Calvin Coolidge where people really put deep thought into what they, what, what, what they spoke. Um, so, I, you know, when it sort of despairs, on the other hand, um, it's a resilient country. 
and uh, we've been in bad times before. And uh, you should keep at it. And, um, and one should continue to try to have the kinds of debates uh, fostered by the kind of intelligent and informed journal journalism um, on all sides of these questions, speaking up to the American people and not simply down. Um, that's, that's, that's pretty wishy-washy, uh, as I hear myself. But, but I think... I, I, I was searching for a pep talk at work. <laughs> <laughs> question is a wonderful question and it illustrates both why American politics is fascinating and why it's aggravating. <laughs> uh, without even attempting to go down the list of each of the issues your question raises, let's just catalog them. The dominance of public relations in American politics. The problem we face when one of the parties becomes captive of a reapportionment regime that placed control of safe districts in the hands of the far right. Uh, the uh, difficulty in uh, dealing with the inevitable desire of legislators to maintain tenure ahead of everything else. The, the fact that there are underlying economic and social agendas that are not in sync. Uh, all of those are issues that generate our American political system and it's it's often non-functional character in uh, dealing with serious issues of public policy. In the university environment, we debate and discuss, and in writing editorials in respectable publications, we stake out positions, but when it comes time to try and implement them, then you're faced with what I referred to in my loosely organized original comments, and that is the real world out there, made up of people with lots of personal agendas, attempting to protect a lot of personal interests, ranging from re-election to contributor interests to ideologically strongly held positions. And the result is that big, complicated cacophony of uh, craziness that makes up American politics. And until you reapportion the legislatures fairly so that you've got uh, less of a stranglehold on the Republican Party by the far right, and until you address some of the underlying social issues that uh, Senator Sanders referred to in his comments, those issues are just going to sit there and fester. And it's an unfortunate reality of American political life. If you want to fix it, you got to get in the trenches. you got to get your own PR program going. you got to run precinct organizations. you got to do what Obama did in 08. you got to elect people. So it's doable. It's just very hard to do. Can I just add a word? Um, I mean, I know this being the University of Chicago, I shouldn't say this, but a great movie to watch is Escape from New York, Kurt Russell. <laughs> So, uh, I watched this when I was a kid. It came out in the early 80s. And the premise of the film is that by 1997, New York City has become so crime-ridden that they've just decided to turn Alcatraz into a giant, ungoverned, let's see, turn um, Manhattan into a giant, ungoverned Alcatraz because, and let the kind of the bad guys run, run the island. Um, and then, I mean, the, it's an idiotic movie, and, but... You lost me at Kurt Russell. But, no, but what's, what's interesting about the movie is in 1983, it was just about plausible that crime in a city like New York on then current trajectories would get so bad that that's what you would have to do. And even if you look at the criminology literature from the early 1990s, very smart people, John DiUlio, were talking about the rise of the super predators and we were, you know, all these our neighborhoods were going to be, you know, there were going to be these terrible, evil people, cracked up, coked up, whatever, running through, murdering you know, scores of people. What happens? Well, actually, the United States witnessed one of the most remarkable uh, periods of social renewal in its history over the last 20 years. Crime rates are uh, way down. Crime in New York City is uh, mur the murder rate in New York City. I think last year there were about 350 murders compared to well over 2,000 murders in 1990 or, uh, or 1991. So, Trend is not truth. And we make this mistake all the time. By the way, China, you know, oh, China, I mean, I remember when I was a kid, Japan was going to take over the world. In the 1960s, the Soviet Union was going to take over the world. Why? Because idiot social scientists said, well, economy goes this way, and therefore this line is going to remain straight forever. That's not, that's not the case. And trends go in all kinds of directions. And the United States has shown this unique and remarkable capacity for renewal and regeneration 
not just at the social and economic level, uh, but also, I think, at the political level. I mean, people talk about how polarized politics were. Are they really so much more polarized than they were in the 1850s? Actually, I think they're much better. Uh, what about the 1970s uh, during the, the Nixon Watergate year? You probably argue they were much more polarized uh, back then. I mean, people sometimes quote this wonderful line from Adam Smith, there's a lot of ruin in a nation. They don't really know where the line comes from. Uh, Adam Smith is in Edinburgh, and he is informed that the British have just lost the Battle of Saratoga, uh, which basically meant that they were going to lose the war. Uh, and uh, it meant the end of Britain's North American empire. Between 1783 and then the reconstitution of their empire after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, Britain didn't really have uh, an empire. Now, I'm not endorsing British colonialism. I'm simply saying that Britain then went on to have a second act as a major world power after this colossal defeat, which meant the end of their, their largest and most important colonies. So there's a lot of ruin in a nation, but there's a lot of renewal in a nation, too. Um, and, you know, I basically, I can't help, I mean, I'm such a pessimist about so many things, but I'm so incredibly optimistic about the events. It's just very quickly, what are the three major, a historian 30 years from now, what are they going to think about the first 10, 12, 15 years of, of the 21st century? Great innovations. The, incre the, the invention of social media, um, or the really the, the ubiquity of social media, this is made in America, okay? Um, what's another one? What you could call smartphone technology, tablet technology, at least in my industry, absolutely revolutionary. Another made in America invention. Probably the third thing would be fracking. However you feel about it, it's a big, big deal. It's a new energy revolution. All of it made in America, not accidental, because this country has resources and an ability to renew itself, which I really think makes it unique in the world. Um, so I think you should be an optimist and go to it. <laughs>
And the third program uh, that ends up actually taking all that the students are engaging in in terms of the, uh, the speaker series and the fellows program uh, and putting it into practice is our internship program. So just in the first summer alone, which was 2013, uh, we had over 150 internships uh, with elected officials, offices, government agencies, not-for-profits, political think tanks, political consulting, and media. Uh, these are $4,000 a piece that are provided to the students for 10 weeks, 40 hours a week. Uh, and in those cities where we have a large concentration of our students, so Washington, D.C., Chicago, New York, uh, the Institute of Politics also arranges for programming around these internships. So in D.C. last summer, we had 75 students who interned in D.C. Uh, we had a student whose internship was to actually arrange the program uh, with help from our staff here in Chicago and with the Federal Relations Office from the University in D.C. And those students had two to three events per week where they were not only actually engaging in their internship work during the day, uh, but able to understand what some of their classmates and colleagues were doing across the city. Uh, and the idea is, you know, after having one of these internships three or four years at the university, uh, you can leave with a much better idea as to what you want to do than I left college with uh, back in 1996. Uh, and that's what we're seeing already with students actually taking advantage of what they're doing here during the year and what they're doing with the summer and actually graduating with jobs. Um, and that's a nice thing to have, uh, especially in this economy. And it's a, in, an, in an area where these students feel extremely passionate. Um, so I, I just, this was a, a session that you here as alumni are, are actually being able to engage in. Um, think about this same panel with our students, which happens multiple times per week, uh, and the students leaving here with the same type of excitement about what our uh, uh, alumni here at the University have done and knowing that that's something that, I, that they can actually do in the future. It's, it's very special and it's something that uh, we've all enjoyed being a part of. Um, so with that, I know that this is uh, uh, run a bit long. I just want you to know that there are going to be re uh, refreshments coming in, so feel free to mill about, and those will come in momentarily. Uh, some members of the Institute of Politics staff will be here. Uh, and I just want to again thank our panel for uh, a, wonderful, a wonderful talk and for taking your time to be with us here today. <laughs>